for a moment. Good morning, Epic Church. How's everybody doing? Hey, it's really good to see you guys. Turn to your neighbor if you have one and say, Happy Independence Day. Weekend. All right, so here, here's the goal over the rest of the weekend, guys, is to keep all your digits, all your digits, your fingers, and uh, stay healthy and enjoy the weekend. So thank you for showing up. But it is also significant, too, because we have the freedom and privilege in this country to join together like we are today. And I am extremely thankful for that. So thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us today. Hey, if you're new with us, uh, do me a favor. There's a long card in your seat at the very bottom. You can tear this little section out. And it's uh, where you can put your name and information, your phone number, and your email if you prefer. And uh, drop that in one of the baskets. There's one on my right, one on my left, and then one at the back. Or just hand it to me right after the service. And uh, we'd love to get you plugged in and answer any questions you might have. So do that. And if you flip that card over, too, you can also write down prayer requests. We love to join each other in prayer at Epic Church. So please write those down. Every single one is significant, and we count it as important. Uh, I just want to give a big shout-out to everybody that has helped since the tornado in Andover. It's hard to believe it's been over two months ago now. We're kind of in the final stretch. There's been a lot of sheds that have been going up. There's been a lot of volunteers that have shown up consistently. So I want to, can we give them a hand real quick for those guys and girls? So I think, I think we're getting there too. So my ask is this, if you have the margin capacity to come out and help, even if it's just for a few minutes at a time, 
uh, talk to David Lamagna, get with myself, talk to Jonathan, uh, Jacob Barrett, I think is leading up a lot of those, those things. So uh, just get with one of us and let's, uh, let's see these people get through this last stretch out in Andover. All right, so the series at the table that David's been preaching. Hey, you can't just have a series and talk about at the table without actually meeting as a church at the table. So next week after service, July 10th, we are going to have a quiz over the series. So don't leave your seats. There's going to be, it's just 200 questions. It's nothing big. Uh, so if you pass that, you can come and have lunch after service. Just kidding. But we do want to see you for lunch after service. And uh, if you can bring your favorite uh, side, we'd love to see you. We'd love to fellowship with you. I urge you to join us. It's going to be a great time. And it'll be a chance for us to push our kids off to youth, right? Everybody excited about that? Oh, you're not? Okay. All right. I don't see any youth in here right now. So uh, it's going to be a great time. So kids going to camp. Speaking of camp, so we have our punch board. If you don't know what that is, it's out here in the, in the uh, big open room next to the entry. There are numbers that you can punch out. I don't think you can see very clear on the screen, but when you punch those out, you take that number. So if it's a 63, you're going to donate $63 to Kids Camp. Uh, just a great opportunity to support them as they go and learn to fellowship with one another and learn more about Christ uh, coming up here in about a week. So uh, small groups is how we do life with each other here at Epic Church. And if you have not got plugged in, not only is that small group uh, just... They're missing out on you. So I highly encourage you just to do life with other people outside of Sundays. And come talk to me if you have any questions about small groups in Epic Church. We have literally one every day of the week, uh, especially coming forward. And there's new ones coming about here before too long. So we're looking forward to that. Prayer group is uh, Saturday mornings here at church at 8 a.m. So if you're interested in that, we want to see you come and join us in prayer. So as we continue our heart of worship, I'm going to ask Mr. Rich to come up and close us in prayer. Let us pray. <clears throat> Father, last night as I was uh, uh, meditating on what to, to share uh, from your heart, uh, I uh, had a problem with uh, all the fireworks going on. I was secluded in my uh, little study room with the shades closed so I couldn't see the flashes of uh, fireworks going on. But then, as a result, all I heard was the, uh, the battle sounds of, uh, of fireworks. Uh, it truly was a battle uh, of fireworks. And it kind of reminded me again that um, our freedoms uh, are not free. And uh, even our Declaration of Independence 250 years ago uh, that did not occur without conflict, without uh, sacrifice, without blood being shed. And uh, just uh, reminded me that uh, how often we uh, uh, celebrate uh, Fourth of July without uh, being mindful of the battles that uh, had to occur for freedom to occur. Um, and so uh, I uh, just uh, remindful of being uh, grateful for those who have served and even out of this church for uh, for our freedoms and uh, I but also was reminded of the battles that we're still fighting dealing with freedom and uh, even in our own country uh, fighting battles for freedom of uh, of uh, choice or freedom to uh, fight for rights of life and uh that sometimes you ask us to be in the battle, that sometimes, usually it's not involving bullets, but maybe the ballots. And uh, I pray that um, uh, you will have us uh, be uh, warriors for you, whether it's for as prayer warriors or as uh, helping others fight their own personal battles that they have in life. I just praise you for uh, the freedom you give us through your son and, uh, and the blessings you give us for being able to be in a country that has the principles of, of life, liberty, and, uh, but also foundation of, of God as, uh, as our general. I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you guys stand with us as we continue with our worship? Turn this thing around 
turning around, God turning around, God turning around. We're calling on the name, changes everything. God turning around, God turning around, God turning around. Cause all of my songs 
Scripture today is from Luke 22, 14 through 23. And when the hour came, he reclined at table, and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this, and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in, remem in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrayed me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another, which of them it could be who was going to do this. Good morning, Epic Church. 
Yes, yes, that's me. Glad you guys could be here with us this uh, 4th of July weekend. Uh, any of you got major plans coming up over the next day or two? Going to have a quiet evening at home, any of you? No. No, well, a couple things just in case you are not caught up to date on what's going on with people in our church. For one, uh, there's two recent birthdays. Michelle Vanderhoff's back after having her third grandchild. Her, what's the granddaughter's name? Tilly Ruth. Tilly Ruth. So uh, that, that's exciting. Um, and there's another baby who celebrated a birthday, Mike Vermillion, <laughs> over here. Celebrated, was it 62? 64. 64. It keeps going up. This is not, he looks great for 64, you know? Too bad he's 58. So, but yeah. So make sure to wish this guy a very special happy birthday for the birthday boy. But uh, no, hey, we are, uh, like I said, we're glad that you all are here. Uh, about a year ago, my family moved into a new house. We've lived in Andover for seven years, and then we lived there now for an eighth year in a new house. We were looking for a little more space, and it seemed like a good time to take advantage of the market, and it was really a seamless transition. We didn't have much trouble selling a house. We didn't have much trouble buying a house. We sold and moved pretty effortlessly, but it went a little too smoothly. You know that? You, you ever have that feeling like, not every, like everything went too right about it, like it was too good, everything just fit together too well. Um, I had no idea what this house was going to cost me, not because there's anything wrong with the house, but because when you look out my front door in July, there is this giant white fireworks tent. You, yes, we, we live very close to what is known as tent city, which is probably the largest fireworks stand around. And it's really, it's not an inconvenience to us. We don't really hear anything from over there. It's not like it really interferes with our life too much. The big problem with it is that the 4th of July is my son's favorite holiday. And uh, he waits for the 4th of July more than he waits for Christmas. All year long, he anticipates that tent going up. He even joined a betting pool with my neighbors this year about what day the fireworks tent was going to go up. Uh, yesterday, he went out and he helped build a platform for various mortars and other explosives to be fired from. Um, but all summer, he peppers me with questions. How much money can we spend? Are there different tents we should hit up? You know, I heard the price of this is good over here as compared to over there. I mean, this is the Super Bowl for him. This, this is the day the whole year revolves around, and he's not alone. Now, now I, I decided I was going to just try to figure out, okay, how much money do people spend on fireworks? And, and from the year 2000 to the year 2019, Americans went from spending $407 million a year on fireworks to $1 billion. Wait, hold on. That's not the crazy part. That, that's like 20 years. In 2020, it doubled to $2 billion. One year. You know what happened with those stimulus checks. Um, <laughs> last year, it went up to $2.2 billion. The whole country wants to burn money with my son. But what's ironic is... That is, for as much as people are participating in this patriotic fanfare, that might be as far as patriotism goes. According to the Harris Interactive Survey, two out of three Americans interviewed don't know any of the words to the national anthem. Wow. Now, hey, that's not the test of whether or not someone's patriotic or whether or not someone cares about their country. I've been at plenty of baseball games where I, you know, I can get the oh, say, can you see, but there's a little part in the middle that I, I forget the order, and so I can mouth the words watermelon. Like, have you ever done that in church? You know, like, okay, I don't know this song, or I don't really want to sing it, but if you say the word watermelon, it looks like you're saying all the right words. Really, it's true. true, true. Next song, it's going to be so quiet in here because everyone's going to be like, I got to know. No, other people still have to sing. It doesn't work otherwise. But all I'm saying is that we're not always as connected with what we do with why we do it. 
The fourth is about freedom. It's about how our nation got independence. I mean, if it wasn't for George Washington, we'd all be speaking English right now, you know? Did you get that? That's a, that was clever. Uh, you guys are no fun. But it's fair to say tomorrow most of us won't be thinking about America as much as we'll be thinking about America, you, you know? But I think that's a common problem we have as people. We aren't always as connected to what we do and why we do it. We enjoy what we do. It's not that what we do isn't important to us, but we don't always understand the purpose or where it comes from or where it originates from. And uh, that's what we're getting to in this series called The Table. We've been working through the Gospel of Luke. About one-fifth of the Gospel of Luke is done in the setting of the table. If you were to pick... Uh, if you were to pick five verses randomly from the Gospel of Luke, there, one of them would feature Jesus sitting at a table, talking about the table, going to a dinner, or leaving a dinner. You could say that all of Jesus' ministry is centered around his experiences at the table. For Jesus, it was the main way he engaged with people. It was the way, main way that Jesus even understood God and his kingdom. And today, we're going to take one, another look at the last table Jesus ate at before he died, a meal most commonly known as communion. Now, at Epic, every week, we take communion. It's a part of our worship service. Not every church takes it every week as a part of how they worship. So it may, if you're new here, this may not be what you're used to. Or maybe for others of you, you're so used to having communion that it'd be weird not to. But for Jesus, the communion table was the most important table he sat at. Look at what Luke 22, uh, 14 through 15 said again. It says that when the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And Jesus said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you. All throughout Luke's gospel, We've been looking at all the tables Jesus ate at, each one showing something about who Jesus was or how he lived with people. At every table, someone was eagerly waiting for an important meeting with Jesus. But this is the only table that we're told that Jesus was eagerly waiting to eat with someone else at. Think about that. Jesus said that the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and that's what he did. That's how he lived. That's how he connected with people. But this was the meal he was waiting for. He spent three years looking to eat this meal with his disciples the same way that Josh waits all year long for 4th of July. So today, we're going to look at what made this table so important to Jesus as we look at the sacrament of communion. Now, the night Jesus instituted communion, it was Passover. You saw that in the verse. That he had been waiting for this Passover with them. Passover is a Jewish feast commemorating God rescuing Israel from Egypt. Every year, thousands and thousands of Jews would come from all over the world to come to Israel to celebrate the Passover there together. In Israel, in a lot of ways, this is their 4th of July. This is their Juneteenth. Jesus was with his disciples in the upper room of a friend's house. It was also on this night that Jesus was going to be betrayed by Judas, one of his own 12 disciples, which makes this very strange that this is the meal that Jesus was waiting for. Because a lot of the things we celebrate, we celebrate in hindsight. Things that have happened, good things that have happened. Jesus is celebrating this meal with foresight about what's going to happen. And I don't know about you, but if I know this is the night I'm betrayed, if I know the next 24 hours I will be tortured and brutally murdered, this is not the meal I'm eager for. I spent three years in fear of this day. I don't spend three years desiring this meal. But for the disciples, this meal represents something else completely. Because for the disciples, this meal is election night. And in their mind, they're going to win in a landslide. 
This is the night they're going to celebrate that there is a new king. For all the things Jesus taught, the disciples had their own ideas of what the next few days were going to look like. Even though at this point, if you read through the Gospels, Jesus three times explicitly tells his disciples, I'm going to be murdered, I'm going to be buried, I'm going to be risen from the dead. I'm going to be murdered, I'm going to be buried, I'm going to be risen from the dead. Says it over and over again. No parables, no metaphors, no I wonder what that means very explicit they still come into this night and they think okay so like next week where where do we set up shop where do we what castle should we move into this is this is going to be our kingdom they think jesus is about to be coronated as king after all only a couple days before jesus is welcomed into this town as a king the crowd shouts hosanna and they lay cloaks before jesus and wave palm branches as jesus comes into town on a donkey and so the disciples are fighting about who gets to sit next to jesus and they're eating and drinking like this is a celebration they're not even together that night remembering what passover is about They haven't gathered that night thinking, okay, we're going to remember the way that Moses led the people out of Egypt. They are there all celebrating, okay, Jesus is going to be king. We've been with him the whole time. We're his entourage. Let's now have the best seat so we can get the rank of where we're going to be. And it's right in the middle of their celebration that Jesus sobers everyone up. He doesn't just say that he's waited for this meal. He says that he's waited for this meal just before he suffers. That's not, that's not a campaign speech. Jesus takes bread and a cup and he tells his disciples in verse 19 and 20, he says, uh, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, he takes the cup, and after they had eaten, he says, this is the cup that is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. Jesus says that this act of taking bread and wine together is about more than a meal. It's actually about consuming Jesus. And this has a lot of significance if you were Jewish then. At, this, at the first Passover, they, they took a lamb's blood and they painted the doorposts with it. And then the people in the house would eat the lamb. And so the reasoning was that this lamb was acting as a protection over the people of Israel. God was sending in an angel and he was going to take the firstborn from every household. But if you had the blood on your door and if you were in the house consuming the lamb, you would be spared. And it was in that one night, through the death of so many sons, that that Israel was freed from 400 years of oppression. And here's Jesus saying that in this night, through the blood of another lamb that they're consuming, that there would be one son given to protect them. And so if this blood was on the post and they were eating the lamb, it was a part of you, it was in you. And so every year these families would eat lamb to show that they were still a part of the protection and the salvation that God had for them. And so when Jesus says, eat and drink this bread and this wine as his body and blood, he is saying that he is the new Passover, that he is the one building a new covenant, and that it's in his life and in his death that these 12 would now find their life in. But Jesus says as they eat and drink this new covenant, this Passover, that one of those same 12 people he is giving his life for will be the one who betrays him. It says in verse 21 and 22, Behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. Could you imagine the disciples at this point? Everyone might pull their hands off the table. (laughs) For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to the man by whom he is betrayed. 
Now, if you know the story so far, you know it's Judas Iscariot who will betray Jesus. But let's stop and appreciate for a second that Jesus offered communion before he ever identified there'd be a betrayer. Jesus doesn't say, hey, uh, Judas, why don't you run to the store for a few minutes? And then say, okay, while Judas is gone, let's have a conversation. He doesn't say, hey, uh, everyone eat, but oh, uh, I, tore, oh, I only tore 11 pieces. Sorry, Judas. He doesn't do that. He hands the bread and the cup as much to Judas as he hands it to anyone else around the table. Because Jesus is giving his life for his betrayer as much as he is giving it for anyone else. And so the next time you don't feel worthy of Jesus in this table, understand that Jesus has this meal for you. That, that the entire reason Jesus is going to the cross is because you belong at this table. Jesus wants you at this table. And so we know it's Judas, but at the time when Jesus hands it out, none of the other 11 disciples did. And so everyone does what everyone does when there's an accusation. You ever watch like a murder mystery? Who done it, right? Everyone's trying to figure out who the traitor is. But how do you figure out who a traitor is? I mean, you do this with your kids. If you got any kids, you know that if one, first of all, if anything's broken in your house, it's one of them. You already know that. That's how it works. But two, uh, if you, you, all you got to do is line them up and ask them who did it, right? And then just be quiet. That's all you got to do. Just be quiet because those children will turn on each other. They will fold on each other like bad poker hands and they will start ratting each other out for things that they did three weeks ago. Like they're like, oh, hey, Ma, you didn't know this, but... Oh, but, but, but dad, you know, I don't know if you also knew this was, they will just consume each other. They will eat each other alive. And so the only way the 12 can establish their in innocence at this point is all of them try to prove that they're better than each other. Look at verse 24. This is right after a dispute aro arose among them as to which one of them would be regarded as the greatest. So all of them go, it's not me, it's not me, it's not me. Well, it can't be me because look at my resume. You, you, every, this is where this conversation comes from. So the disciples go from trying to prove their innocence to Jesus to trying to establish they're better than everyone else at the table. They start to think back to all the other times that the other disciples failed. They start to think back to all the times they proved they were the better disciple than the other disciples. I mean, we don't have any of the language of this conversation but I've, I've thought about it. Like if you read through the Gospels, what kind of stuff are they throwing at each other? Hey, Peter, you remember that time you tried to walk on water and you almost drowned? Oh, yeah, I didn't see you get out of the boat. Andrew says, hey, you know, you guys could talk. I introduced half of you to Jesus in the first place. If you actually look through the times Andrew's mentioned in the Gospels, he's always bringing someone to Jesus. He's always showing someone to Jesus. Well, you know, you wouldn't even know this guy if it wasn't for me. Matthew says, you remember that awesome party I threw you, Jesus? And the rest are saying, you mean the kegger with the prostitutes? <laughs> Peter says, hey, I, I was the first to figure out Jesus was Messiah. And Judas says, yeah, but Jesus called you Satan one minute later. I bet you it took 10 seconds for them to tear each other down. These people who have spent three years learning the love of Christ together. And Jesus cuts right through it all. In, verse, in chapter 22, verse 25 through 30, Jesus says this. He says, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. And those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest. And the leader as the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not one, the one who reclines at the table? In other words, if you're sitting at the table, the, the waiters are coming to you. But I am among you as the one who serves. 
you are those who have stayed with me in my trials, and I assign to you, as my Father assigned to me, a kingdom that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Look at what Jesus says. He says, you keep thinking about being a part of my kingdom like it's being a king of this world. You think this is about power and position, rank, popularity, but while you were arguing about who you were better than, you forgot who is first. You made it all about yourself and you forgot about me. You say you're doing this to honor me. You say this is about me being king. If that's true, then how come you're not acting like me? And how come I'm not acting like you? If this is really about me, then why aren't you acting like me? Because I have the best seat at the table. I'm the king who you say you won't betray, but I'm the only one at this table serving. It, and he says, it's true, you guys are going to be the ones who usher in my kingdom. But you forget that you eat and you drink at my table. And so if you want to be a Lord in my kingdom, then you need to put others first. Jesus says, you eat and you drink at my table in my kingdom. And what is it that I just told you to eat and drink? My body and my blood. Think about how long it took them to forget that. First communion. Biggest night Jesus has been waiting for. Took six minutes for them to forget. They're still picking the bread out of their teeth that is the body of Christ. They can still taste the wine on their breath that's Jesus' blood. And the first instinct they have is to tear each other apart and tear each other down. They can't even finish their first communion without thinking about themselves, their goals, their agendas, their lives, and their petty fights. And Jesus right there says, you're going to eat this meal with me again one day. But when you do, you need to get what it's about. It's kind of pathetic to read how these people were with each other to know that Jesus is about to suffer and die and all they can think about is themselves and what's wrong with each other. But when I read about communion here, I can sometimes forget to put myself at the table. Like, I'll, there's a lot of times I read stories in the Bible and maybe you've done this too. I would never do that, you know. I, I, would, I would never screw up that way. Can, I, can, how could they miss it? How, how could they miss that? Like, Jesus has been pretty plain. He told them three times. You know, I, I go to Old Testament stories. Man, if I was there back then, I would have never worshipped the golden calf after, you know, they got saved from Egypt with Passover. I would have never done that. I'd have thrown my golden first. See, see, we do this thing with history where we look back and we say, I would never be those people. And that's, that's the most dangerous place to be in because you're probably in your first step to being one of those people. I can look back at this story and I see myself as someone different, someone who has learned from their mistakes, but the truth is I'm as pathetic as any of the 12 around the table when I come to the table. All of them would abandon Jesus just a few hours after Judas would betray Jesus. Peter denies Jesus three times and the rest of them run and hide like cowards. These would-be kings show how disloyal and selfish they are. And if I'm at the table and I, pretend to be, I can pretend to be brave and faithful but I had been racing the other disciples to get out of there. And truthfully, I'd have offered the Pharisees a better deal on Jesus. I don't mean... 
simply that if I lived back then, that, that I would just would have betrayed Jesus. I, I can think of a hundred times since that I've come to this table of communion that we have around the room, and I can think of the amount of times that I've come to this table the same way that they came to that table. I'd love to pretend that when I come to communion that I'm, I'm in prayer and that it's spiritual, but I, there are so many times that I've come to this table just as petty and shallow as v- and vain. There are times that I can come to you, and I'll just talk about it from my own experience. I can come to this table and wonder, hey, as a pastor, did I speak well enough today? Did I perform well enough? What did people think about what I said? There, there's times I wonder if someone's listening. There's times I wonder it, 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 where I'm more concerned about how is someone living. I can pretend that it's out of concern, but really uh, I, I could be more concerned about how someone's living and whether or not they're meeting my standard. There's times I'm thinking about my relationships with people. Is this person mad at me or am I mad at them? Or what do they think of me? Or do I need to protect my reputation? There's times that I am not in this room at all. I'm here in body but not in spirit. I'm thinking about something at home or something coming later or something I'm hoping for. I'd love to tell you that every time I come to this table and that I eat and drink Jesus' body and blood. But really, I'm wondering about my place in life. I would have fit right in with the 12 because I come to this table the same way they did at the First Communion. I can't tell you that when I get up on Sunday morning that I wake up eager to come to this table. I might think about going to church. I might think about what I've got to say. I might think about seeing you all. I don't know that I come to this table the way Jesus comes to this table. I come with my life, my plans, my own control in mind. And so how do I avoid that? How do I I start to look at the table, Jesus, the way Jesus did? And I think the secret is in what Jesus said in verse 19. It's real simple. He says this, do this in remembrance of me. I think we struggle with what it means to remember because I think we take remembering things like we do with facts in school. You know what I mean? Like, do you, do you remember who was the first president of the United States? There we, George, there we go. Way to go, Todd. Todd passes uh, kindergarten. But <laughs> he's, a, he's a Marine. That's good. No, <laughs> I'm teasing. That, that's too much. Todd's going to... Uh, don't hurt me, Todd. Um, but... But, but we do it like facts. I know what communion is. The bread's the body, the cup's the blood. Got it. But think about this. I, I want us to really embrace what remembering is. The, G- Jesus wants us to understand something. That, and it's not can we recite facts and can we know things. The secret to this is not thinking of ourselves it's to thinking of others. It's to, uh, the secret to not thinking of ourselves, the secret to, to thinking of others is for us to spend every week thinking about Jesus. Thinking about Jesus. We make communion just about the death of Jesus, but there is so much more for the disciples to remember about Jesus than just his death. When Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me, Jesus has not died yet. They can't remember his death yet. They got to wait a day before that happens. There had to be memories. We've been studying the life of Jesus. What kind of memories do you think the disciples had? What do you think they remembered when they took communion? Go ahead. Uh, this, this can be interactive for a second. What do you think the disciples remembered about Jesus that night for the last three years? What's that? Calming the storm. Calming the storm. I, how do you forget that? Feeding, 5, Feeding a lot of people. 
Walking on water. Peter better remember that one, right? <laughs> What's that? Yeah, there was a before Jesus, right? And where they were after, where, the, where they met them. Healing the sick. Oh, man, how many of those? Casting out demons. I mean, think about this. They remember when Jesus is baptized by John, when he heals a paralytic. He called a woman a dog once that, that then, then blesses her for amazing faith. They, they remember the tax collectors that he sits with, that, that they told stories about kingdom and, and planting seeds. They remember times he'd heal an old woman and raise a dead girl. They'd remember a widow's might, a rich young ruler, when Jesus cleansed the temple. They remembered when Jesus told them that they'd change the world and be fishers of men. There is so much more to Jesus than just the idea that he's dead. And every time the disciples took communion, they would remember the three and a half years they spent with their friend, their Savior, and their God. Communion is not just about the death of Jesus. It's about the life of Jesus. It's about the life that he lived with them, about the life that they have with him and the life that we live with him. We, I have a living Savior. He is alive, and he is alive in me. And while I take communion and remember what he has done in the Bible, I can take communion and remember what he has done in me. I remember when he saved me. I remember the night that I was baptized. I remember it was a lake and it was cold. I remember when he called me into ministry and I didn't want to go. I remember my wedding when Tamara and I pledged ourselves together in him. I remember the, when he made me a father in my children and how he teaches me to be a father. I remember him in the times he has humbled me. I remember him in the times he provides for me. I remember him comforting me in my fear. I remember him being faithful when I have been. And while Jesus' death and resurrection are so very important to me, they do not make up the entirety of my relationship with Jesus. My life is filled with memories of Jesus. And the further I travel with him, the more he teaches me, the more memories I have. And every time I come to this table, there is something more for me to remember. I can't just come to this table and know that this is a Jesus thing that we do because Jesus said something about it. To remember has so much more than do we get the ideas that are being conveyed. I have to, I have to recognize and realize and understand that my whole life is not the way that it was because Jesus entered it. I think that's the difference between this being the living word that's living and active in our lives and just a book that we religiously follow because we're trying to keep our parents happy or we're afraid of going to hell one day. I have to remember. I have to know. I have to... I have to become in contact with that part of myself that needs Jesus, that recognizes that I'm at the table as a betrayer and Jesus is at the table to save me from myself. Wow. And so right now we're going to take communion and we're going to take the body and the blood and this is the time we look at what Jesus has done for us. And we look at what he gave, his, we look at how he gave his life for us, but we also take this time to remember him, where we can look back at our relationship with Jesus and what we've been through. And I think the question you have to ask yourself when you come to this table and remember Jesus is, what are your memories of Jesus here? What do you remember about Jesus as you come here? Is, is it when 
you, you were saved? Is, is it when? Is it a time that you prayed and Jesus answered you? Is it a moment you failed and he lifted you up? What, what, was it a time that you read something in the Bible and for the first time in your life you were like, I think that makes sense now. What was it? Because when we do this, we do this to remember. We don't do this to recite facts. We do this to remember who he was, what he did, his death, his burial, and his resurrection, and what he has done every day since in our lives. And so I want you to take some time and I want you to think about your relationship with Jesus. Uh, Tim's going to be playing, and I'm going to pray, and we invite you to come to one of the three tables around the room to come eat and to come drink and to remember your relationship with Jesus. And if you're new here, hey, we're glad you came. Um, this table, I, I, I know I've given a pretty long explanation about it, but this table for us is the center of our worship service because for all the things that worship can be, this is the one time that I would tell you that we come, we just come face to face with Jesus. You know, I, I, the, the, this is bread and grape juice. We get it from the store. But what makes it Jesus is what we remember in this moment. That we come and we come, we come face to face with the very gospel essence and the very gospel story. Jesus said, this is my body. This bread is my body and this cup is my blood. And we invite you to be at this table. This table is open to everyone. And so whether you feel unworthy or whether you feel too worthy or whether you feel like a betrayer who has let down God time and time again, at no point did that stop Jesus from distributing it to everyone at that table. And so we ask for you to do the same thing, to come to the table with everything that is on your heart and to come face to face with Jesus. If you're new, though, uh, again, we're glad you came. On the bottom of those cards, is a, uh, those uh, bulletins, is a connection card. Fill that out, tear it off, put it in the basket. We'd love to connect with you, talk with you. On the other side, there's a place for us to pray with you. We'd love to have that opportunity to pray with you and for you. Uh, if you'd like to turn those into the offering baskets by the communion tables, we'd, we'd love to make that connection with you. This is also a time uh, for us to give our tithes and offerings, for us to get what this is about, for the, us to give in the way that God has given to us to, to, to make Jesus the center of our lives in more way than one. Um, and, and this is a time where as we give, we're, we're not just supporting the work of what's happening here, we're supporting the work of what's happening all over the world as we continue to spread the mission of the gospel across the nations. And so if you have your tithes and offerings, you can drop them in the baskets then or, or you could do uh, giving online. But, but this is our time, whether you give, whether you take and eat, whether you pray, no matter what you do, this is your time to remember Jesus. And so let's do that together. Father in heaven, You are the first among us, and yet you sent your Son to be the least among us. That for all of the people who should be served at the table, you came as a servant. 
for all of the people who deserve honor and praise. Your son spent his life lifting us up. And God, there are so many times that we, we can come and be a part of a church and we can come and we can sing and we can sit in the same judgment of each other. We can sit in the same judgment uh, of other people in our lives. We could come and think that we deserve it or we can keep ourselves from this table because we don't. And yet you remain at the table, still serving, calling all of us to still come to the table and to come be with you. And so God, it's my prayer during this time that your spirit would recall to mind for us so many times that you've been present in our life that as we come to this table and we remember Jesus, that we would not just recognize what the bread and the cup is, but we would recognize all of the times in our lives that you have been present with us. God, keep yourself in front of us as we come to this table. God, we thank you for, for the bread and the cup and what it represents. We, we thank you for um, the hope that is at this table. God, we thank you that we get to experience the gospel here week after week. And so, um, God, be near our spirit, be near our heart, and help us keep you in front of us so that we can go out and serve others. God, we love you and we praise you and we ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. When you're ready, go ahead and stand and go to the tables. Come eat, come drink, uh, come give, put in your connection cards, and then let's sing to Jesus. Would you guys stand with us as we continue with worship?
of interesting what we've been talking about <clears throat> how God led the Egyptians out of Egypt and led us into the promised land led them into the promised land and and how that correlates to our lives too we in ourselves and our sin we were in slavery in Egypt but Jesus brought us out he brought us into a spacious place a place flowing with milk and honey freedom and this last song we have is a new song it's called Egypt so if you guys know the song Sing along with us.
great week. We'll see you guys next Sunday. Happy 4th of July.